All right, everybody. It is time to continue our story of the X-Men versus the Mimic. What an unusual opponent. Uh, someone who is able to imitate all of the powers of the X-Men. And he's ready to attack. And I'm ready to continue the story. How about you? All right, you'll remember that, uh, the, uh, that Calvin Rankin, the Mimic, found out where the X-Men headquarters are, and he's arrived. He's changed into his costume. He's uh, uh, imitated all of their powers, and so he says he intends to defeat all of the X-Men. So let's see what happens. Suddenly, the Mimic hurtles upward, propelled by a leap of beast-like agility. Thoom! Leaping into the air, and instantly a metal command from Professor X rings out. Angel, I don't know what he's planning, but stop him. Angel says, it'll be a pleasure, sir. Remember that the Mimic has uh, absorbed Professor X's mental ability, and so he is able to stop the probing that normally the professor would be able to do. Before the high-flying angel can reach his prey, the mimic reverses himself in flight. Ha! He says, unlike you, I've got more than a pair of wings. Bam! And he comes down hard on uh, Angel's chest. Angel says, Ugh! He attacked the way the beast would if Hank could also fly. Who's next, says the mimic. I'll take you one at a time or all at once. Gene, says Cyclops, halt uh, Angel's fall telekinetically. Iceman, keep the mimic at bay with an ice javelin while I try to singe his wings. Gotcha, Psych, says Iceman, Iceman, and he puts together a javelin, which he tosses, but uh, Mimic says, did you forget? I have the same power and the same defenses as you do. And so, with his eye beam, he destroys uh, Iceman's javelin. Whap! And with his own ice power, he creates a shield that blocks uh, Cyclops' own eye beam. Brack! He, and Cyclops realizes he mimicked my power beam to shatter the javelin and stopped my own beam with an ice shield. Wow, that's pretty clever. And so Angel says he's landing. He thinks we're beaten. Stay back, all of you, says Cyclops. I'll tackle him alone. No, advises the professor. He's too strong, too unpredictable. You must fight as a team. And Mimic says, ha, thanks for your powers, X-Men. Now I'm going to use them to defeat the whole lot of you. You're on your own, X-Men, says the professor. The danger is clear. The task is yours. The moment is now. And the beast says, first come, first served. And so the beast tries to attack. Angel says, leave some for me, Hank. I've got a little debt to repay. And uh, Marvel Girl says, he can't outfight us all. And uh, Mimic says, all at once, good. I'll be able to end it faster this way. And here comes the Iceman on his ice slide. He says, careful, Psyche. He must have something up his sleeve. It's too late for caution, says Cyclops. Nothing will stop us now. But suddenly, a sharp mental command is heard. X-Men, halt! Behind you! Quick! Look behind you! Behind us? Where? What can it be? And so they all turn around, but... Oh, no! That wasn't the professor. That was the mimic using the professor's mental ability to confuse and distract the X-Men. The beast realizes it. It was a ruse. The mimic did it. Naturally, 
says Mimic, for now I possess the same mental power as Professor X. And so then he creates some snow and shoves it at Cyclops. Here's snow in your eyes, Cyclops. And here's some hail in your eye, Mimic, says Iceman. No matter how many powers you have, you can't be everywhere at once. Whits! Iceman throws some hail at him. And a thump. Here comes uh, the beast after him. Uh, uh, Mimic says, uh. And Beast says, a most effective maneuver, Bobby. And now allow me to perform the coup de grace. All right, whatever a coup de grace is, I think it's a big deal. All right. Bam. And he jumps on top of the Mimic. It would appear that the time has come for our moment of truth, Mr. Rankin. Hold on, Hank, says the Marvel Girl. I'll try to topple him by applying telekinetic force to his legs. And she thinks, I've got to keep reminding myself we're not attacking one of us when we fight the Mimic. How about that? We beat him, says Iceman. And in record time, too, says Angel. Uh, B says, a most exemplary example of X-Men prowess. Marvel Girl asks, have you had enough, Mr. Rankin? Cyclops, he's the smart one. He says, I still don't like it. He still looks dangerous to me. Professor agrees. You're right, Scott. Then, moving with the combined speed and agility of the angel and the beast themselves, he grabs Marvel Girl. That's what Professor says. He's seizing Marvel Girl. He says, stay back, all of you. And so suddenly a powerful telepathic thought rings out. Let him go, Cyclops. Do not stop him. But one blast of my ray, says Cyclops. The order stands, comes the mental command. Hold your ground. Do not attack. And so as a mimic runs off with Marvel Girl, he says, Ha, I was too fast for them. You know, I thought maybe that was the Mimic telling Cyclops to stop, but evidently that was the Professor. So, uh, seconds later, they're in a car, driving down the road, and Marvel Girl asks, Where are you taking me and why? Don't you know how hopeless this is? There's no place you can go where the X-Men won't find you. Uh, you believe it, says uh, Mimic. I caught that thought the professor threw. He's afraid of me. Anyway, I want them to follow me. That's why I grabbed you. And as he drives along, he thinks, my wings are getting smaller. My body's turning normal because I've left them. All I'll keep is the girl's telekinetic power because she's still near me. In some distance behind the speeding car, we find the X-Men's helicopter. I had to let him escape, says the professor, so that he can lead us to his destination. By probing his brain, I knew that Gene would be safe. I pray you're right, sir, uh, says uh, Cyclops. If any harm should come to Marvel Girl, I would... And um, Professor X thinks, is that the sentiment of the deputy leader of the X-Men? or the anguished fury of a young man in love. Okay, so the professor is, realizes, of course, that Cyclops has strong affections for Marvel Girl. A short time afterward, uh, Marvel Girl sees a deserted mine. But why? Mimic says, it's more than a simple mine. Let's go. I'll show you. Uh, Marvel Girl realizes it's amazing. His wings are gone and his body no longer resembles the beast. How on earth can he keep changing that way? I bet we're about to find out, and the secret is in that mine. Soon, deep within the mine, Jean Grey is astonished to find living quarters. It's a place for someone to live, in comfort and in secret, but for what purpose? Uh, Mimic says, while we wait for the X-Men to find me, I'll tell you a little story. Then perhaps you'll finally understand the secret of the Mimic. 
It's the story of a young boy whose father was a scientist working on a strange, dangerous experiment, more dangerous than any of them dreamed. And so the young man, Calvin, peeks in and says, Dad? But the man says, I've told you to stay out when I'm working. This room is off limits to you. But the boy was young, foolish, and defiant. One day when his father was out on an errand, he tried to satisfy his, his youthful curiosity. And then, oh, I knocked over a beaker, gas, filling the air all around me. I can't stop breathing it in. So the chemicals uh, merge together and create a gas. What's going to happen next? Coughing, gasping, his eyes smarting. He carefully cleaned up the lab and then left. But in the months and years that followed, strange things began to happen more and more frequently. Look, we see Calvin fighting a man. Pow! As his fist uh, 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 beats his uh, opponent's jaw. He thinks, I don't get it. Blackie's the school boxing champ, and I'm a dud, but I'm fighting as good as he is. Lately, whenever I'm near anyone, I seem to be able to do whatever he can do. And look, he's playing sports now. It was that way all through school. He was as good as the best athletes. So long as he was near to them, there was nothing he didn't excel at. And as his ability grew, so did his arrogance and his conceit. And as the pitcher throws the ball, uh, Calvin is able to thwack, hit the ball uh, uh, into a home run. And the pitcher says, that's your fifth homer in five times at bat. He says, naturally, it's not hard when you're playing against a bunch of no-talent misfits, but that's not true. It's not that his opponents have no talent. It is that he is mimicking the talent that they have. Even when he was in class, he always seemed to know as much as the teacher. Eventually, the dislike which the other students had for him turned to distrust and then to actual suspicion and fear. And so these three guys are over here in a corner talking about Calvin. I tell you, there's something scary about the way he's good at everything. You're right. It reminds me of a robot or something. He's like a machine. I never heard of anyone being tops at every sport and getting straight A's in every subject without even trying. And Calvin thinks, I should worry what they think of me. I'm better than all of them. They're just jealous of me. That's what. But the boy's father finally became aware of what had happened. He knew men would someday rise against his son, and so he took him to a lonely cave. And so the father goes into the cave and says, we will live here until I found a way to help you. And Calvin thinks, if only my powers would be permanent and not leave me when I'm no longer near the one I'm mimicking. For months they hid in the cave while the scientists built a machine, one which would make the boy's power last forever, but the machine drained so much current that it short-circuited every fuse in the county. And uh, the, the, the father says, listen, the warning signal, someone is coming. Beep, 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 beep. Calvin says, according to the radio, people are suspicious, suspicious of what's been happening here. They know there are powerful machines operating, but they don't know why. And so looking on a view screen, the father says, they've traced the source of their power breakdown to our cave. An angry, fear-crazed fear -crazed mob is capable of anything. We've got to protect ourselves. I'll detonate the main explosive cache, sealing off the mine entrance. Calvin says, if only they'd waited a little longer, it wouldn't have mattered. But in setting off the explosives, the scientist underestimated the force of the blast, and he was unable to escape in time. Whoom! The explosive power throws him backward, and boulders are flying in all directions. 
Hours later, after the mob had finally dispersed, the son dug himself to freedom, his heart pounding with an unquenchable desire for vengeance. And now after his father is buried, he stands at his tombstone and says, I'll make them pay for what happened to you, Dad. Even though the, your machine was buried under all the debris, I'll find some way to reach it again. And when I do, I'll become the mightiest man in the world. I'll gain the power of everyone I meet, and I'll keep all that power forever. And so he, now that his father is dead and the, uh, the machine is buried under uh, all of that debris, uh, he can't get to it because he has no power now. Maybe that's why he's wanting the powers of the X-Men, so he can get to the machine below. Let's keep reading and find out. Then, says Marvel Girl, you are that boy, and you want the X-Men to follow you here, so you can trick them into reaching the machine for you. Right, says Calvin, and you're the bait that will bring them to me. Ah, my wings are beginning to sprout again. That means they're getting closer. And so the mimic can tell that Angel is getting near because his wings are growing. And uh, the mimic says, it's time to greet them now as I open the door telekinetically with the power I've mimicked from you. My only weakness is the fact that my powers fade when the one I'm mimicking isn't near me. But my father's machine will make my powers permanent. All I have to do is find a way to reach the machine beneath all those tons of rubble. My wings are full size now, he says, uh, so I know the X-Men are just outside the cave. That means I can use Professor X's mind power at last. It's working. The mental power I'm now able to mimic from the Professor can easily locate the exact spot where the machine lies buried. The fools, they don't suspect that I wanted them to follow me so I could use their own powers to defeat them and the entire world. Ha! I knew Cyclops would have to be with them. Now by mimicking his force beam, I can blast my way through the debris in minutes. Just a few minutes more and I'll triumph over all mankind. Crack! <laughs> That's quite a sound, isn't it? As his eye beam blasts away uh, the stones. Outside the mine, uh, Iceman sees a deserted mine shaft. Now what? Professor says he wanted us to follow him. He didn't even attempt to shield his mind from my mental probe. Sheer folly on his part, uh, says, uh, says Hank. Why would he have wanted us to pursue him into a mine? We're not even members of the Prospector's Union. Angel says if he's in there, we'll find him. He won't escape from us again. Professor says he is indeed in there. I can promise you that. Cyclops asks, what of Jean, Professor? Can you mentally scan the area and tell if she's all right? If she's been harmed, no power on earth will save the mimic from me. And Iceman says, when I hear that tone in Sykes' voice, I wouldn't want to be his enemy if I was as strong as a hundred mimics. And the professor assures him, she's perfectly safe, Scott. It won't be long before we reach her. With his mental probe, Professor knows she's directly behind that iron door. Use your power beam's lowest intensity, Cyclops, so it doesn't penetrate too far. I understand, sir, says Cyclops. Just enough force to shatter the lock. <laughs> okay, just a little bolt takes care of the lock. Angel says, you did it, and of course he did. Seconds later, upon reaching the captive girl, Scott Summers silently takes his place behind the professor's wheelchair once again. Marvel Girl says, I knew you'd reach me. I knew it. And Scott lets Warren untie uh, Jean, and Professor realizes that there's something strange. He thinks, Scott doesn't seem to want Marvel Girl to realize how desperately concerned about her he was. Beast, of course, is more concerned about the 
imminent danger. He says, where is the mimic? But even as Hank McCoy anxiously asks the question, which is uppermost in all their minds, Brack, his uh, eye beam shoots out one more time, and he says, I'm almost there, just one more blast. That did it. I can see the opening just ahead. The machine, I see it, just as Dad left it. The explosion didn't do any damage to the inner cave. That means I've won. I've won. There, I've activated the master switch. The current is on, and everything is set for me. Look how the power, the electricity, flows to the machine. Mimic says, all I need do is stand under the machine, and then no power on earth will be able to stop me. The world will be mine. Zap! But look, here comes Cyclops' own I-beam. What? says the Mimic. And Cyclops says, hold it, Mimic. The X-Men, you fools, you are too late. Cyclops says, we'll see about that. Angel flies from above and says, get him. And here comes the Iceman with a club. And the Beast is bounding and Marvel Girl is there as well. Angel says, look out, he's creating an ice wall as the Angel tries to fly over it. Uh, Beast says, that, my friend, is painfully apparent. And uh, Mimic says, how can you hope to battle someone who can hurl your very own weapons against you? Now watch how I easily cause this ice barrier to topple. So look, he's going to push that ice wall on top of the X-Men. Whoomp! And so it falls on them, but he flies uh, free. He says, I'm going to seize the advantage by flying over all your heads. Hold it! No one move! Uh, he's got the professor. He grabs the professor, but professor says, Stay back, all of you. I'll handle this myself. You're whistling in the dark, mister, says Mimic, and you know it. But we must act, says Cyclops, if he uses that machine. Mimic says, There's nothing they can do while I have you. Don't attack, says the professor. You can't win. You must trust me. Ha! At the last minute, you, re you revealed yourself for the coward you are, Professor. You held them off, fearing for your own safety. And so I have triumphed. My powers will now be permanent. There is nothing I cannot do. All mankind will be at my feet. My father will not have died in vain. But then, a startling unexpected turn of events occurs. Let's turn the page and find out. Angel says, the mimic collapsed. I'll grab the professor. The professor says, Beast, quickly take the, minute, the mimic. This entire place will blow up within minutes. We've got to escape. But why? How? asks Marvel Girl. Iceman says, well, this is some time to play 20 questions. And so, uh, Cyclops says, Jean, levitate yourself. Hurry, girl. And uh, Marvel Girl says, don't worry, Scotty. I can keep up with all of you easily. Iceman says, yeah, it's easier for her than for me. She doesn't have to worry about running out of ice. Well, Iceman doesn't seem to have to worry about running out of ice either. He's got his slide going, and uh, Cyclops is right there, right behind him. And here comes the beast carrying, uh, carrying the mimic, mimic. Thump, thump. He's bounding out of the uh, mine. Angel is carrying Professor, and he asks, "How can you be sure that the mine will blow up, sir?" And uh, Professor says, "I myself caused the short circuit mentally." And as the beast is carrying uh, the mimic, he says, "This is no." avocation for one who espouses a life of leisure. Well, certainly if Hank wanted leisure, he shouldn't have joined the X-Men, because they keep him busy. Whoom! The mine explodes again uh, with the force of the uh, damaged machine. 
angel says we made it we're safe and Iceman is covering his head he says whew talk about the nick of time and uh, the Cyclops is using uh, a, a piece of the door as a shield to protect himself and most of all uh, Marvel Girl and over here is the mimic uh, but look no wings uh, his feet and hands are normal uh, look someone says the mimic uh, I don't get it his wings are gone and his figure it doesn't resemble the beasts anymore what changed him he's still near us and uh, the professor says it was his father's machine that proved to be his undoing his greatest mistake someone asks you mean his father's machine failed professor on the contrary says the professor the machine worked perfectly what's the professor saying you see dr rankin knew the powers of mimicry which his son had accidentally obtained could only lead him into terrible trouble and so although the lad didn't realize it his father created a machine to take those powers away and now since I've mentally removed his memory of all that has occurred he is free to leave a new normal life awaits him and so Iceman says so that's why you wanted us to let him use the machine you sensed it all the time and so now Calvin leaves he's got his duffel bag in his car but no memory of being the mimic so what will he do now well he'll have to live a normal life like the rest of us so as they fly away someone asks I wonder what would have happened if he had gained the power he wanted well lucky for us and for the world we'll never know all right and so we've come to the end of the story of the x-men and the mimic who's next who's the x-men's next opponent let's find out well their next threat is an opponent named Unus, the uncanny threat of Unus the untouchable. Well, what kind of mutant power does he have? Looks like he can't be touched. And that's an interesting power. How can you attack someone if you can't touch him? And so we'll find out how that story uh, uh, begins and uh, then ends and we'll find another new uh, enemy that the X-Men have to face. Well, until then, I'm glad that you're following along these stories about the X-Men. We'll have another one soon. Love y'all. Bye-bye.